I'm Boots Riley. I'm from the coup and streets with the social club and I'm uh, been involved in the Occupy movement, Occupy Oakland movement to be exact. Very good. Um, okay, let me. So I was going to ask, you know, where you got, I heard, I watched some interviews of you getting ready for this and um, you said that you actually got involved in music in order to pursue activism. And so how did that come about? Well, I was already an organizer by the time I the, started being an organizer at 14. And, oh. um, and so, you know, I wanted to get the ideas out there in a larger way um, than, what, than what was happening at the time. So I figured out, figured that music was a way to do it. And I had already been interested in music before I was an, an organizer, so it was just uh, it was it was just a good way to combine the two. It was a natural fit. So, and when you say organizer, you mean a union organizer, a labor organizer? Uh, let's see. I'd done a few things. I organized. Me and a few people had organized a uh, walkout at my high school, uh, which <laughs> the twenty two hundred students walked out and that was against some budget cuts that were happening. We won, we won right then. So of course we were felt filled with power. Um, and, but I also was, uh, I also helped organize, uh, an anti-racist farm workers union in, um, the, in central California around the Delano McFarland Wasco area. Yeah. And I would do that in the summertime. Um, and so, um, I'd go stay with families and uh, that that were working in the great fields out there. And this was a union where, you know, the UFW didn't organize, uh, didn't organize illegal immigrants. And this was a union that was organizing illegal immigrants, which was harder to do. And uh, so we would, we, the, the different whoever our host family was would give us an assignment for the day and sometimes it would be like you need to organize the caravan today or you're going to make a speech uh when at noon when we're getting off work or whatever and that was how, how i cut my teeth for like four different summers wow that's amazing um and so you had been calling even before occupy wall street started at all you had been um, calling for a, a radical labor movement and, and suggesting that, you know, the radical movements were happening on kind of the macroeconomic level and on a, you know, worker level on, you know, things that were really affecting people's day-to-day -day life. It wasn't as radicalized as it needed to be, in, in your opinion. Is that correct? Yeah. I felt like uh, many folks that considered this self-radical or revolutionary were, um, just talking about things that was almost abstract to most people. Um, many people agree with the fact that this system needs to change, but they're involved in a struggle against the system on an individual level. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, if we want to grow, we have to have a movement that is involved with people um, fighting that system collectively. And that, that fight is at, the, is at the level of survival for most people. And that's around wages and housing and things like that. Right. Um, okay. And so then I, I had seen that you actually were at um, Occupy Wall Street in the earlier days, like the, within the first week or so you visited in New York and then were involved in starting Occupy Oakland. Is that correct? No, I wasn't involved in starting Occupy Oakland. I, oh. I actually I had visited Occupy Wall Street once and. Um, before that, in the summertime, I visited Barcelona and I visited Syntagma Square in Athens. Right. And, and uh, so all of those gave me an idea of what was going on. I actually, when I visited Occupy Wall Street in New York, um, I thought that it was kind of a, uh, a really unorganized thing and I, I really didn't understand how they were going to get anything done when it took so long to... Uh, figure out what was going to 
be done with the $700 they had gathered. Um, and so I, I really didn't, I wasn't excited about it. Um, and uh, some folks that started Occupy Oakland invited me to come to their first day. So I checked that out. Then late, a few days later, um, I came and performed. And uh, then when uh, they got evicted the first time on the morning of October 25th, um, I helped get the word out about what was going on and uh, came and helped with the march that was supposed to take over the plaza, which is then the infamous one in which Scott Olson got shot. Yeah. And being involved in that, all of that stuff kind of sucked me in. <laughs> and have you changed your mind on your earlier opinion? Uh, I think that that my earlier opinion came from being involved in organizations that were much more organized and much smaller. And there, and a lot of people that have not been involved in Occupy Wall Street yet have that opinion, or in, of, in the whole movement, have that opinion because of that. It looks loose, it looks unorganized, and it is loose and unorganized. But actually, that's the reason why a lot of people can join and become involved. Many times you have organizations in which it seems like there's a few professional people that know everything. And, you know, and, and definitely in any movement, there are people that are able to galvanize others more. There are people that um, are driven to do more work. There are people that have different levels of speaking ability. Um, hopefully, you know, being involved in Occupy Wall Street movement will give people the practice at speaking and give people the practice at organizing that changes and, and levels some of that out. However, I think that people coming from other organizations don't realize how hard it has been for them to pull teeth and get people to be involved with them. Like movements around social change have been virtually invisible before now. And part of that has to do with one, not picking the right campaigns, not picking, not, not picking campaigns that have to do with changing people's life that have to do with direct action that can that in which people can be involved in that changes their 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 uh wage or changes their home living condition or connects it with the idea of the whole system people haven't been doing those things this is something that catches the pulse of where people are at and makes people want to be involved in the form of it makes people feel like even if they feel like it's somewhat unorganized, they feel like they can actually get in and be part of it. And, uh, you know, and, and, and the other ways that people want it to be like, they don't make people feel like they can be part of it. Right, right. So it has that incredible strength, which I've actually been really impressed with myself. I didn't have any kind of experience with this form of organization, but the fact that you know, if you can really grasp the fact of horizontality, you can decide how you want to participate, and you can participate in that way. You know, you don't need permission. You don't, you know, you can just start doing it, and that is very empowering, and people can kind of get involved in any way that they want to do it. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about Occupy Oakland. The thing that, that struck me immediately and has continued to impress me about Oakland is that there's two things, and one was the services and just the way the camp was set up was amazing. You know, I remember even before um, kind of the media focus was on Occupy Oakland, Naomi Klein had come out and visit and had tweeted about how impressed she was with just the amount of people they were feeding and the services that they were providing. And when you saw pictures of Occupy Oakland, I was also impressed just by how diverse it was in terms of age, gender, um, socioeconomic status, uh, race, etc. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's, the, that's definitely the case. I mean, if you look at the picture in the Chronicle, even though it, it, it really uh, lambasts the, the last port shutdown, the picture that they have in there is definitely one that is more diverse than 
the picture that's usually painted. Yeah. Of, uh, and 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 I have no idea whether you know what the other cities' movements are, but yeah, we have people in many different communities that are that are uh, involved. So right. And the other thing about Occupy Oakland, um, even more importantly, is that, you know, when the Scott Olson injury happened and national media attention was trained on Oakland, that they immediately went for a general strike and then went to a port shutdown, which were ways that immediately cost people money, cost the 1% money, you know, hurt them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been, so I've been impressed. I think Oakland has done that better than anywhere else oh definitely and part of the effectiveness is that there are a lot of different groups of people different from different communities and different uh, different political backgrounds that are working together that normally wouldn't and that causes a lot of tension but we still work through it and make it happen right right like yeah right now I've, I saw that um, there was some criticism regarding um, I, something to do with Mayor Kwan, maybe. She had pulled her Facebook page down. I wasn't sure what it was about, but it seemed that... Well, what she said was that, I mean, what she said was that people from out of state and out of the area were posting racist comments on her page, and I don't doubt that that happened because I've seen a, a lot of racist comments. Um, right period about, I mean, obviously I get them all day and, uh, and Quan definitely gets them because, uh, you know, this is a racist, uh, society and there's a lot and the internet is basically heaven for, you know, racist 12 year old kids. Right. <laughs> right. I, uh, I, um, was, when I saw the footage of Scott, the night that Scott Olson was injured, I was completely blown away. I couldn't believe it was the United States. I couldn't believe that was going on. And the people I've talked to from Oakland since were kind of like, yeah, you know, that's what happens here. I mean, you know, this is a community that unfortunately is accustomed to police brutality. Well, and, well I have yeah. to say that police brutality actually is happening all over the world. I mean, in Chicago, it's not that long ago that they got that that the Chicago Police Department had to let they had to let go a lot of people out of prison because it turned out the Chicago Police Department was torturing people. I'm talking about Guantanamo Bay or whatever um, uh, CIA rendition type torturing people to get them to confess to doing anything from armed robbery to assault, right? This is something that happens in the United States because the police are not there to uh, are not there to protect the people. They're there to they're here to protect the status quo, and the status quo is oppression and exploitation. Um, and you know um, the fact that it was Scott Olson who was a young white kid that got killed that woke some people up to it um but police but but police brutality is nothing new in the united states not just the bay area right I'm, i mean right. quite frankly it was it's more astonishing to see a young black man not astonishing but it was more gruesome to see a young black man laying on his belly getting shot in the back mm -hmm. by a cop mm -hmm. um, I think what it was what 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 was astonishing to me about what happened with Scott Olson is that it just was really dumb of the police to do that with all the cameras away but what people are uh, with all the cameras going on there what but what the press is is not stating and which may have to do with the, the police's extra boldness that night is that the police had told all the mainstream media to turn off their cameras and leave before right. the before the press got there and what's even worse is that the press the press complied. did right the press complied so 
there were no there was no mainstream media around there because they all did exactly what the police wanted them to. The same thing with with Zuccotti Park. Mm -hmm. They asked the press to leave and the press left. Well, I think the press is going to have to start realizing to have real journalistic integrity, you cannot do what the government tells you to do. Right. Otherwise, they are censoring the press right then and there. Right, and it just opens if you up allow, to brutality. Yeah, and if you're a journalist that allows government censorship, um, then you're not really doing your job. Right, you're a propagandist, at least in part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and so you have, oh, and I, I just read, I think you just posted your Facebook page about the fact that um, you know, movement, social movements as they're happening have never been supported by the mainstream media. It's not surprising that they're not being supported now. It's not surprising that they're interviewing a trucker who opposes the port shutdown and not the many, many truckers who supported it. And not only supported it, but put it out, <laughs> put out letters of support. Mm -hmm. And not only supported it, but did the same thing themselves a few weeks, be I mean, a few years before, right? right. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, and, and when I asked, I, I asked mainstream journalists about this and it kind of, kind of left silent and not, un not knowing what to say because it's the idea that they wouldn't put out an article like that is, is just so new to them. Um, and they also just, you know, and, and, and even though it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, they understand that it doesn't ring true to their idea of journalistic integrity. Um, yet no one wants to feel like they're in a, in a, in a profession that is so easily controlled. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the port shutdown, I mean, you know, the word that I got back for the most part is that it was successful. I mean, they were shut down all up and down the coast, which is what the goal was. Well, every, every just to be clear, every port wasn't shut down the whole right. time. Um, but um, some were. And the part point is, is that all up and down the coast in Texas, um, and in other places, um, there was, and people tried to shut it down. And this is in the face of a press, of, of the press who days before were saying that the Occupy Wall Street movement was over, mm -hmm. right? And predicting its untimely death. Um, how nobody went in and addressed those statements afterward. Um, so yes, it was successful because it, just in Oakland alone, we caused the loss of $8.5 million. So all together, who knows what the numbers are, but it's tens of millions. Mm -hmm. Right, and, exactly. And, and that's the goal. Place where they didn't shut it down. They slowed down production and they, uh, they stopped it for a certain amount of time. Um, and what's also not being reported is that in L.A., the port truckers actually shut down some of the gates. Oh, right. Of course, that's not being reported. And, 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 and what some people saw on, I think, Punk Boy and SF's uh, Ustream um, that was that I was talking to. There were there were there were uh, port truckers who stopped their trucks and joined our line mm -hmm. in Oakland six of them um so it was extremely successful yeah i mean has i mean i feel like organized labor has been pushed so far back now that it really almost does take this kind of community support they can't they can't strike for themselves at this point yeah they are bound by many laws that um stop their movement in in many ways and occupy wall street 
is something that's not bound by those laws. And we're, we're not only um, limited to the tactics by which their contract allows them to be uh, limited to. I mean, yeah, allows them to be limited to. We do what's right, not simply what's legal. Right, right. And so, I, and I had seen you comment, we're starting to get closer and closer to the election, and so people are making suggestions about, you know, are you going to run candidates, are you going to back candidates, these types of things. And it sounds like you think that the movement should steer clear of electoral politics. Well, let's say this. In all of history, all the progress, in all of the U.S. history, the progressive changes that we can think of in the last, hundred years um, have all come from movements not from elected officials and you know and, and I'm talking about everything from uh, Medicare to uh, Social Security uh, affirmative action civil rights movement it was not because there was a movement of a grassroots movement to get a can candidate elected it was because there were movements in the street. So, for instance, in the in the 20s and 30s, you ended up having a million car card carrying communist party members um, who were always active, and there were marches in the streets all over the country. There were sit downs and shutdowns inside factories. There were there uh, the, and the people. There was widespread support. Places like. Montana and Utah and um, and uh, you know Nebraska Michigan Wyoming those were considered hotbeds of communist activity right so the grandparents of the people that are now voting Republican many of them were communists many of them were radical many of them wanted a socialist government um, and Frank FDR thought that there was going to be a revolution, that there could be. So the New Deal was to quell off that movement. Right. Same thing with the Civil Rights Movement. You know, uh, J JFK was at first against the Civil Rights Bill. Mm -hmm. He was, o he only was down with it because there was a movement stopping actual profit. The person that signed that that made the Environmental Protection Agency, and the person that made affirmative action was Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. Not because Nixon was a good candidate or right. a good president or cared about anyone other than himself, but because this was the late '60s, early '70s, and they and there was revolution going on all over the world. And there was a gigantic movement here building. Now, okay, so that's what makes change. If we want to make change, we need a movement that that's that is able to get response from the puppet masters, not the puppets. Puppets can't do anything. But now, now let's take recent history. The last ten years, there was a gigantic anti-war movement until John Kerry started running. Then that anti-war movement turned into a pro-carry movement, and it disappeared. Disappeared off the face of the planet. All those organizers started, started organizing for carry, and then all of a sudden you have a finish line. The finish line is that election. That election is over, there's no more movement. Same thing, then the anti-war movement started building up again, and turned into a pro-Obama movement. There was this giant grassroots organizing drive to get Obama elected. And people even said, well, hey, now we've got all this going on and we can have a movement to pressure things to happen. Obama got elected. There was no anti-war movement. There was no movement of any kind left because mm -hmm. there was this finish line and that was it. So. If you want to kill the Occupy Wall Street movement, the quickest way to do it is to get it into electoral politics. That's the quickest way to do it. Many of the people suggesting that 
the Occupy Wall Street movement, get into electoral politics. Some of the organizations like MoveOn.org, things like that, their idea of how the world works is different than one in which movements stop profit and stop industry in order to get what we want. Their idea of change is getting the right person elected. So the idea that many people had when joining Occupy Wall Street is not the idea that some of these folks have that are suggesting that. Now, this doesn't mean, you know, like if, if you know, I personally don't vote on candidates. I vote on propositions, things like that. This doesn't mean I think anyone's wrong if they decide to vote, whatever. If you feel like doing that, you know, it's, you know, I don't care if you do astrology, if you vote. <laughs> uh, <laughs> don't you know put any effort into organizing that because what we need is a movement that um that is able to control industry and able to make change um to people's livelihoods and that's what's going to grow and that's what's going to make the real change we can make any politician do what we want them to if we have a strong enough movement however we don't have a movement we can elect any politician we want, and we won't get what we want. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I had seen uh, a couple of times, actually even before Occupy Wall Street, you had talked about it, and then I'd seen you talking about it recently on Twitter, about um, trying to raise the wage of service workers, trying to focus on McDonald's or Walmart or some of these places. Um, yeah. So that, that's, that's a possible future inroad that we're going to be taking. That's one thing. We're also moving people. We moved Gayla Newsom back into her home. We got some, a few things going on around that. Excuse me. But yeah, so definitely, I think that that's, you know, there's no, no reason why companies that make billions of dollars in our communities shouldn't be paying a, a wage, wage that people can can survive on, yeah, you know, um, and so, uh, you know, it, yeah, it, that, really, was actually, that was actually that was actually go on. paying fifteen to eighteen dollars an hour and still make billions of dollars. Right now, the franchise owners, that that's a hard, that'll be a hard fight, but we can do it. We shut down all the McDonald's in Oakland. Um, we could make them renegotiate the corporation, renegotiate their contract with the franchise owners so that they could pay the workers more. Um, because, you know, they have to do that real quick. Otherwise, people will start going to Burger King. Vice versa is the same thing with Burger King. So we could make it happen. You know, let's not forget that, for instance, we, we just did a port shutdown. We worked with some longshoremen. Longshoremen make about a hundred, hundred ten thousand a year. Now those jobs used to be like low-paying custodial jobs, mm -hmm. and you know people were like, "Wow, why, why the hell would you pay somebody for manual labor? Pay someone that much? Why? Because their actual labor creates billions of dollars in profit." That's the same thing with fast food workers. Their actual labor creates billions of dollars in profit. Whether it's just flipping burgers or hitting a, a you know, do, doing that, they're spending their time and they're, and they're only getting a tiny bit of it. And we need to change that. That's one of the things we could do. Same thing with Walmart workers. Right. Yeah, and you're actually discussing that in a bigger context, which was this, is that, um, you know, Oakland is has spent a ridiculous amount of money on these raids and they intend to shut down schools and spend more money on police forces and you made the point that this has been the policy for the last I don't know 50 years in Oakland of just spend more on police stop the violence campaigns when in fact what the problem is is that there's no good paying jobs and and you made yeah. the point that drug dealing is a low paying job actually. It's not it wouldn't even be that hard to compete with if there actually were decent jobs. Exactly. You know, um dope dealers aren't able to get 
a good lawyer when they when they go to jail i mean when they get charged they're not able many of them aren't even able to easily pay the rent although they're selling dope they're not even able to to you know have a you know car that's you know working there are many dope dealers that are that are at that level and even just a little bit higher from my years of talking to dope dealers and knowing some because i grow up in a town where there are some is that uh people would quickly take a 15 dollar an hour job right. over right. selling dope so the culture of, of the, the the culture the, the dope dealing is a job that is a industry that is unregulated because it's illegal and you can't go to court and say your honor you know this was my corner and so on. there's no zoning laws in right. dope. <laughs> there's no labor laws in dope dealing there are no you can't go to court and sue because someone sold you a half a key instead of a whole key no so there's a culture of violence that is created just to make the business run and every shooting doesn't happen because of the dope dealing exactly but it happens because of the culture that comes out of dope dealing mm -hmm. and that that is that is necessitated by it so i don't even think politicians believe that putting more money into the police is what you know stops people from selling dope i mean in beverly hills it's not they don't have people don't it's not that people don't sell dope because they're spending a lot of money on the police no they're not not spending a lot of money on the police. People have money to live and survive. And that's right. why they're not selling dope. Well, there's a few people selling large amounts of dope that might be in, in Beverly Hills, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, and so, so right, yeah. We wanna we wanna stop the violence. We gotta have jobs that people can survive on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and so and that, that's a part of the bigger question because in the end I, I don't think this movement is just about jobs and just about people getting enough to survive, but it's about it being fair. And this is something that we can build toward on the way to changing this whole system. Right. Right. And so I guess that comes in with, what, I'll make this my last question. I've already taken a lot of your time and I really appreciate how generous you've been. Right. Um, but of where, where you would like to see the movement going and what, you, what people can do if they want to get involved. Well, here's the next place I want to see the movement going. There are a lot of people with valid criticisms of the Occupy Wall Street movement. Some of those folks consider themselves progressive or radical. What you need to do is be inside the movement and, and, and make those changes because, you know, Occupy Wall Street, the Occupy Wall Street movement is stone soup. That's all it is. There is no movement if there doesn't need to be in there. You know, it's just everybody putting their things in together. You know, everybody, you know, everybody is bringing what they have to the table. And if you feel like that's insufficient, bring what you got to the table. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're going to be growing. I, I want, I hope that in all the different areas, people are able to make connections there with labor make connections there with the community um, and also talk about these larger macroeconomic issues and connect those smaller fights to the larger fights. Right. Very good. Well, thank you so much. If there, um, and I, you know, we really appreciate you taking this much time to talk to us. And once the interview is posted, if there's anything you want us to link, we'd be happy to do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Oh, bye.